Alleluia. And that goes on for a while, and you get these long R's. And um, there's some, lots of medieval texts that talk about this idea that that this wordless melody, this wordless music, was the, the, the way in which we join our voices with the angels in heaven, that, that it's somehow um, beyond words. The joy that we feel beyond words has to be put into music. And where words fail, that's where music steps in. Welcome to Into the Truth, the podcast from the Catholic Truth Society. My name is Pier Paolo Finaldi. I'm the CEO and publisher of the CTS, and it's my very great pleasure this morning to welcome Dr. Matthew Ward. Um, we're going to speak about a subject which is close to both of our hearts. Um, but um, Matthew, I wonder if, if you could kind of introduce yourself. You're a uh, We've, we've commissioned you to uh, write a new set of uh, responsorial psalms for the lectionary that is uh, newly published in uh, sort of autumn of 2024. And uh, you're, you've been writing away for how long now? I think we, I started about this time last year, I think, wasn't it? It was around Advent, kind of November, December last year that the journey started. And yeah, it's been... I'm still feels like I'm still writing them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, quite. I mean, so um, I mean, we'll get we'll get on to a bit more d detail about the the psalms themselves um, a bit later on. But uh, I mean, if you could um, say a little bit. I mean, you you did your doctorate uh, in Cambridge on uh, on sort of liturgical music and chant in particular. So um, tell us a bit, kind of what was what was your journey up up to up to there? How did you how did your love of music start, and how did you get into liturgical music in particular well um as, i mean i started out not really as a singer or liturgical musician at all i mean I, I suppose singing at church i always loved singing at church um always loved singing uh uh hymns some really some of the great old traditional hymns uh we had a, a fantastic parish priest who had a really good taste in hymns i think um and uh so that was that was wonderful as a child um i started playing the cello when i was around uh, seven and loved that and from then on really music was a very central thing uh, in my life and composing as well actually I mean this I still have some little manuscripts from when I was you know just started I think the first thing I ever wrote was something called the toy soldiers march for my cello when I was probably eight or nine years old or something like that um, and uh, yeah I, I was mainly a cellist for, for for my teenage years and all the music I composed then was instrumental music and then I remember my first kind of exposure to chant I think was probably at the uh, the, the faith summer session the, the faith movements um, summer conferences and I remember vividly the Salve Regina being sung after, at the end of night prayer at those conferences and I can I can still I have a terrible memory but I can remember that event I can remember standing in the chapel in in Waldingham school and hearing and singing learning the the Salva Regina and it's you know it's, that was a kind of an, an eye-opening moment for me um, and then when I went up to university to study music I remember I made a decision I just thought I'm going to start singing proper music now I'm going to join a choir and develop that that side of my musicianship and I went to hear two choirs in in Cambridge that were singing chant and latin polyphony to kind of compare them and decide which one i would join i thought i'm only going to join the best one so i um yeah so i i joined the chaplaincy choir and we did so we we would sing every week we would sing at the latin um nervous order mass and we sang chant and we sang polyphony and it was a huge kind of joy and a, i mean it was quite a steep learning curve but i loved it and a couple of years i was running the choir in my third year at uh, university, I did a I did a, a dissertation on uh, some medieval fragments, some fragments of manuscript that I found. Oh, I didn't found. They were they were given to me by the archivist at uh, um, Trinity College, and that was an incredible experience to handle this. So this was ha handwritten. This was notation. manuscript from the fifteenth century, right. and not just like not just. I mean, they were they were used to bind the bursar's accounts. 
of from the 16th century. So this is like post Reformation. Yeah. So they were chucked out. A couple the... of pages torn out of a a, a missile, a, a kind of with with chant in it, and then they were used to protect the verses accounts. So as a kind of fo a kind of binding. Um, and what was what was great was we weren't interested in the verses accounts. We were interested <laughs> in the binding. Um, and in fact, the the librarian David McKitterick at the time he was very happy to unbind them and to take them out and have them professionally photographed you know so that these kind of precious survivals of the of the reformation um could be studied and it turned out that even though they were just a couple of pages from i think it was the the tuesday and wednesday from the second week of lent so they weren't even very exciting parts of the church's year there was really interesting things in there in the in the chant I mean, I should say interesting to people who are interested yeah, in chat. Of course, of course. <laughs> no, okay, wonderful. So, I mean, th this, what, this was in the uh, two thousand, early 2000s, wasn't it? I think that was, yeah, 2006, seven. So, I mean, let, let's, let's have a, a let, let's talk kind of about music within uh, within our, our faith, first of all. We'll, we'll have a, we'll, we'll get a kind of general overview and then we'll go into some, some specifics about what exactly happened, especially during the 20th century. But, um, I mean, let's go back to kind of Christ himself. Um, would would do we know if Christ would have sung? Uh, he would have used uh, mu music in in his. Oh well, yeah, we, I mean, we know a specific occasion when he sung, which was of course after the Last Supper. Uh, I think it's, it says when they had sung psalms, they went to the Garden of uh, they went out to the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, so we know that, um, and we would also have known exactly what he would have sung. Uh, I think the tradition was to sing the Hallel Psalms after the Passover meal. So those, I think, are Psalm 114 to 118. I could be wrong there. I'm sure the comment section yeah, will correct yeah, me. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so those Psalms, which are an, an incredibly, a wonderful series of Psalms, which in fact, in many ways, summarize and um, foreshadow the passion. So they're prophetic of the passion. And so Christ singing those, knowing what was about to happen to him, that would have been a, a really kind of, powerful thing and when this the the disciples would then have looked back of course on those psalms later on and interpreted them in his in light of the passion and resurrection um so yeah we know specifically of course that he would that he would have sung those i suspect being jesus he would have had perfect pitch <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so probably sung them very well <laughs> within his jewish tradition um but yes i mean it's wonderful i think i i should you know one could imagine him of course singing at, at home, singing singing the psalms with uh, with his mum and dad as well, you know, with Saint Joseph and 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 our our blessed mother as well. Great to imagine them singing the psalms, and maybe even, you know, a flight of fancy might imagine Joseph and and Jesus singing while they were carpenting as well. Right, right, right. And and I mean, we we certainly um, tra track the the sort of history of of the chanting of the psalms back to those um, the chant that would have been used in the. Uh, in the temple, and I, I think there has been work done, kind of um, trying to kind of reconstruct that that chant. But it, it's definitely a, there's definitely a continuity there, isn't there? To some degree, I mean, temple worship, of course, ended, mm. you know, um, in AD seventy with the destruction of the temple, and so it was synagogue worship really that then became, I suppose, the the most familiar form of singing of the psalms and singing of the scriptures for the next centuries, and so would have fed into the early church. Um, how much, how closely the chant that we have today resembles that is probably impossible to say, um, especially because of all the influences of uh, other cultures later on, especially the kind of f Frankish culture of the of the of the later first millennium, you know, the kind of time of Charlemagne and, and others. So we could say, you know, the tradition of singing the Psalms is unbroken. Um, but how much that is something that if we were to sing the Psalms, to, you know, if we were to hear synagogue or temple worship, how we would say, OK, this is something we recognize. I think that's probably unlikely. Yeah. And I mean, in terms of chanting sacred text, I mean, that's something which is common to many religious traditions. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 In fact, it's, it's kind of more normal. I mean, it, it would be more normal to, to chant all these kinds of texts than to read them for most of history, I would say, you know. Yeah, I would say so. Yeah, certainly. I mean, um, the 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 use of kind of an oral tradition of chanting sacred texts. Yeah, I mean, you find it in all religions and all around the world, um, and using melodic behaviours to 
articulate and to memorize actually to use these to memorize the psalms um yeah absolutely and and the psalms are fundamental to that in the christian um tradition as well and especially in the tradition of and and reading the learning the psalms of course was the first thing you would do as a monk in the middle ages you know you'd learn the psalms that was how you learned to read and write um and also how you learned to to sing as well through the office singing these um these great texts to a simple tone every day for hours and hours and hours until they were really just embedded into your you know subconscious and i think you know you could say that everything that that um you know a medieval monks kind of saw the world or heard the world and imagined the world through the lens of the the psalms really yeah because they they would have been um reciting all, all or the chanting all of the psalms uh, over what a week or not not even sometimes yeah pretty much i mean uh, the that repetition was just so fundamental that these these phrases and images and ideas would form the way they saw the world and the way they related to god it's the fundamental kind of mode of com communication with um yeah with prayer in prayer so we we've had a we've had a poet Sally Reed on this on this podcast who said that poetry is the language of God. So you know without oh without poetry, <laughs> uh, you know you can't really worship God properly or speak or speak or understand what's what's going on. So um, give give the uh, the the counter argument. The counter argument. That music <laughs> is really the, the language. Well, music is the language of God. Goodness me. Well, I think um, uh, I think it was a a nineteenth century poet who said that all all arts aspire to the condition of music. So there we are. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but but is, is music, so is music the language of God? Well, for that, I think, the an for the answer to that, I think we'd have to say that it depends how you define music, of course. But uh, we could go, I could go all the way back to the ancient Greeks here and say what makes poetry poetic, I suppose, is, is its music, is its rhythm. And you don't have poetry without rhythm, and rhythm is musical. If, um, of course, for the, for, uh, the Greeks... Um, number was musical and then in the in the middle ages music was c kind of classed as one of the one of the ways of discovering the universe and understanding the universe through number so it was considered a science in fact music was the study of things in relation to each other so proportions in particular you know if we think of music as sound waves um, you know and so the 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 way that the sound waves harmonize with one another makes the music pleasant or unpleasant and the whole of the universe, to the medieval mind, the whole of the universe was was harmonious. Um, the movement of the planets or the spheres, and also the human person as well, keeping our our bodies and souls in harmonious relationship to each other. And you know, for a very long time, the belief that there was a belief that the music that we made, we sung or we made with instruments, affects the balance of the soul and the body, but also somehow relates to this great kind of connected music that we can't hear but we participate in and so yeah i think that i mean the image when we think of the image of heaven um it's not usually depicted as a, a poetry recital right. <laughs> so right. much as a concert as a choir right yeah. we talk about the choirs of angels um and um and i think that that's there's something fundamental that goes beyond that goes beyond the words and I think that's what we love in poetry as well, is the rhythm of it. There's a, there's a magic beyond simply the meaning of the words. And in the Middle Ages, one of the things that, um, that they talked about was the idea of certain types of chant or certain types of singing, um, without words especially, as being like the voices of the angels, um, especially the long R at the end of alleluias. Right. So, you know, so you think of lots of medieval alleluias, something, a chant like... Um, Alleluia. And that goes on for a while, and you get these long R's. And um, there's some, lots of medieval texts that talk about this idea that, that this wordless melody, this wordless music, was the, the, the way in which we join our voices with the angels in heaven, that, that it's somehow... Um, beyond words the joy that we feel beyond words has to be put into music and where words fail that's where music steps in right. 
And I mean, already you have kind of, I, I don't know whether, because uh, I've, I've been reading recently that the, the, the famous the famous line from St. Augustine that everybody trots out, you know, that to to uh, mm-hmm. to sing is to pray twice, although I don't think anyone's found exactly no, where. No, I don't think he did say that, where, sadly. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's certainly become uh, a truism um, in, in the sense that to add music to our prayer in, in some sense kind of makes it, a, uh, improves it. So, you know, why, why would you say that that happens? Is that, is that simply a kind of a psychological mechanism or is it something e- even deeper than that? Well, it's interesting on St. Augustine because he actually had, he was in two minds about music and, and prayer um, because he, being, coming from his manichist yeah. background where he was suspicious of the body and the passions and things like that, he was actually worried about whether we should allow singing because he found music so beautiful and so moving that he was worried it distracted from the words. So for him, there was a question of, you know, in the end, he, 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 I think he realized that, that he needed to bow to the wisdom of the church and to St. Ambrose, of course, who was his mentor, who wrote hymns. And it was through the beauty of the hymns in the Ambrosian church in Milan that he was, that he was brought to Christ in many ways. Was that through, um, through hearing the music and the hymns? He found it so beautiful that he was actually a little bit worried about it <laughs> being distracting from, from the from prayer um actually in terms of what it adds one of the things i mean cardinal uh, ratzinger i should say pope benedict the 16th he writes a lot of he wrote a lot about music and 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 its relationship to word and 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 he talks about the fact that we are body and soul matters a lot in our prayer and you know we know that as catholics of course the sacraments are these embodied channels of grace you know and when we kneel for prayer we're kneeling because it helps to unite the attitude of the soul with the attitude of the body and for him music in a sense what it does is it embodies and spiritualizes at the same time and it's a it's a unique fusion of the body and the and the soul um in a way which he for him actually he talks a little bit about it the way it mirrors the word becoming flesh you know, and he talks about the word becoming music as a kind of analogy for that. You know, that it's like a, an image of that, you know, a, a kind of parable of the word becoming flesh, Christ becoming man. Um, and it's how, and the way that it speaks to our emotions and our bodies is a way of, you know, bringing birth, bringing everything that we have, not just the word, the disembodied word that we can find can get really emphasized, you know, in a church, in some, say, you know, uh, more primitive Protestant denominations where there's a suspicion of music and you want to put everything onto the word. Um, you know, there's a danger of you cutting off the body, you know, just like a plain church without pictures, you know, just so you can focus purely on the brain. And what that does is it's, it cuts, cuts us off from something which is good and that God has given us. So it's kind of the difference between, you know, reading a text you know, in your mind, and you know, saying it out loud, or or singing the words, you know, it, there's a sort of levels or degrees to which your body gets kind of involved in that, and sing with singing being probably at the highest level. Yes, exactly. Yeah, and uh, and but on of course on the other side to talk about you know to go back to Saint Augustine, you know, Cardinal Ratzinger in his, some of his writings um, also talks about you know the dangers of going too far in the way of the body. So you could go too far in in both directions. You could you know, you can cut off the body completely and just be entirely spiritualized and just the just the the reading of the word. But you could also have certain types of music that maybe overemphasize the embodied aspect of things and cuts off the the mind. You know, so anything you know, something you know, kind of certain types of, of rock music or whatever that you might try to bring into church, but which are maybe so strongly rhythmic or so so emotive that what they do is they can obscure, like St. Augustine was saying, they may obscure the, the prayer, the prayerful aspect of it, the spiritual or the intellectual side of things. And so, in fact, Psalms are a really good example about this. Um, one of his, in one of his writings, um, Pope Benedict XVI, when he was Cardinal Ratzinger, writes about the line from the Psalm, uh, sing a psalm with all your skill. And he wants to know, what does it mean, sing a psalm with all your skill? And he talks about the Greek word, salete, and the, 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 the Hebrew word as well. 
um, that it comes from. And he talks about this idea that we need to be bringing all the best things that we have, but we need to be finding that balance and that fusion between the mind and the body, which is what he says singing the great church music does. It doesn't go one way, it doesn't go the other way. It somehow manages to fuse and to, and then to raise us mind and body in prayer. So I'd, I'd be very interested if you could give us like a kind of what you, what you see as the kind of arc of, of Christian music um, within and especially with with regard to the Psalms because I, I think that I suppose there's sort of three or four diff important moments I would say you know where, where you, you know you, you you get the development of the chant into into what we now know as as um, Gregorian so uh, and then and then we go to the kind of polyphony and then you know we, we end up with a kind of baroque and and sort of romantic and then and then it'll kind of it kind of splits off into various different directions. I'd, I'd well, you be just interested. it yourself. You don't. No, sorry, sorry. <laughs> you know, but I mean, it would be an, it'd be interesting to know from you what you think kind of happened and, and where the church kind of in, intervenes at certain points and sort of says yes to some things, no to others. Gosh, okay, that's a big, um, big question. Uh, a whole history of church music. Okay, yeah. In, <laughs> oh, you got two, three minutes. Two, three minutes. Yeah, All right. Yeah. Um, well, I think that actually that the point about um, the suspicion of music is 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 actually the key. I think a lot of a, of a lot of this, um, and it rocks backwards and forwards. You know, every new new musical development comes. You know, and certainly in the Middle Ages, it's coming through the setting of church music. But there are always people who are saying we've gone a bit too far musically we need to get back to you know the word so you know the protestant reformers were in agreement in some ways musically with the renaissance humanists who were catholics in italy about what had happened with medieval polyphonic writing so you know where where the model for um for the writing of church music in the say the 15th century had be, been getting towards more and more kind of elaborate musical structures you know and the words in a sense were subordinate to the the mathematical or the mu or the numerical relationships between voices and, and things like that creating very complicated things i mean for example the music of the eton choir book which is early 16th century and which is full of incredibly elaborate, you know, sometimes up to 20 voices singing at the same time, very complicated things. Um, this kind of thing was rejected by Protestant reformers saying, you know, we need to get back to foot. The music needs to be the servant of the word, not so the other way the around. Problem, what the problem was that you were obscuring the words that you were Yeah, singing. that was one problem. So that was one diagnosis. Another diagnosis was that, so when they rediscovered the ancient Greek writings about music, um, in Italy especially, some of the they were reading about it and they were saying well look here this is a story about how you know orpheus can sing a song and he can persuade hades to release eurydice back to life he can bring people back to life with music <laughs> or plato saying certain types of music create certain types of emotion and can mold the character in particular ways and so we need to get rid of those types of music from the republic and they looked at the music around them and they said well look our church music doesn't really have this emotional effect on people and we want to be able to and in the counter-reformation especially we want to be able to persuade you know and, and move people with the the meaning of the words and the music needs to be a servant of that and what they said was well this polyphony is just too complicated it's too distracting the meaning of the word gets lost and so um what they tried to do was to simplify very much until you get uh, you know, a single line or two, you know, we think of Monteverdi and the Monteverdi Vespers as being an example of this, where the music becomes radically the servant of the words. And if the words demand a particular emotion or a particular image, then the music must follow that. Um, and that then leads to the development of Baroque music. Then you can kind of see, by the time you get to the end of the Baroque period, we've kind of gone back again to the, if you think of Bach, how complex Bach is in relationship. I mean, it's still depicting the words a lot, but it's almost overly ornate. And so there was, again, an attempt to kind of strip that back and make it simpler. 
Now, in the night, by the time we got to the early 19th century, music of Mozart and Schubert and, and things like this, the criticism from the church, uh, the criticism from various composers and thinkers, in, uh, especially Catholic ones, in the 19th century was that the music had become too operatic. So opera was, was the, the big thing. You know, we think of you know, Beethoven, and these days we think that's all about instrumental music, Beethoven, yeah. Mozart. But actually, opera was the, the premier genre. And often, they were not wrong about this. Um, Pugin, the architect, complains about, about it, uh, particularly, basically, that you know, you'd have opera singers who the previous night had been singing you know, the, t the lead tenor and the lead soprano in a scandalous plot. Yeah. And then the following morning, they come, to, they come to sing at church for a little extra money. And they're singing the same tunes, but they've tr put yeah. words on them which are sacred words. And so the people who in the congregation who know both the opera, who know the opera, will hear these tunes and be scandalized because previous night it was a love song. Today it's, you know, the Agnus Dei. And, um, and so, the, again, this is the musician's kind of not respecting the liturgy. And so people like Pugin and others, a group called the Sicilians, um, the Sicilian Society, especially in, um, in kind of Germany as well, they were saying, we need to get back to chant and we need to get back to polyphony and composing this music. Because I think there, there's, there's like a real, a really important kind of question, which is, can you just uh, apply any type of music to sacred words and it becomes sacred music i mean that that would seem to me to be one of the the questions that has um continued to to be asked and uh, and continues to be relevant you know and, and until today and i mean the the church i would say has given a fairly specific answer to that and yet the the, the question carries on being asked continually in practice so I mean, you know, uh, I think I think there's a scene in uh, in um, the, uh, the 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 Italian novel, uh, the uh, the Gattopardo, the leopard, in which he he goes to to he goes to hear I think more uh, the mass in a convent, and you know they're singing they're singing the the, the glory I think to the tune of of one of Verdi's yeah. arias. And you know it's it's meant to be a kind of comic moment, and you know this is such a ridiculous thing to do. But kind of why is it a ridiculous thing to do? Yeah, I mean uh, Pugin again when he's complaining about it, he talks about having because he he really hated um, choir lofts for this for two reasons. One that he felt you you know the choir ought to be in choir, they ought to be up at the front with the you know vested and all the rest of it in kind of medieval way. But also the choir loft was kind of a performance space, you know, that you have these performers standing up there and singing. And, he, he, and you know, he, he illustrates their lack of involvement by talking about orange peel and yeah, nuts yeah, yeah. and things that you find lying around in the choir lofts, you know. Yeah, and you have lots of stories about famous kind of uh, organists and composers, you know, entertaining salubrious people up in the choir well, loft. Yeah, exactly. And all that. Yeah. Um, so it's, uh, but that question of can any music be used in support, uh, can any musical style? Again, this is something that um, uh, was looked at by by Cardinal Ratzinger by Benedict XVI. He talks about it, um, and uh, in, in a wonderful essay, I think it's called "The Image of God and of Man in Liturgical Music" or something along those lines. And what? So you t you talk about the Church's answer, um, and you know the Church's answer has come in various different forms. Of, I mean, famously in the early twentieth century, there's uh, Tale. Uh, Selectudini by um, uh, Pope St. Pius X, who talks about this and says, you know, precisely addressing these worries by people like Pugin and, and the Sicilians, talking about, you know, that this mu the music needs to be sacred, and by sacred it needs to be rooted in the tradition of the church, so it needs to be close to chant or it needs to be close to polyphony, it needs to take these as its models. Um, you know, they shouldn't be, he says specifically, we shouldn't be using pianos in, in you know, in, in the mass, etc. Um, and then, of course, you know there are other documents that come later on and are mentioned as well at, uh, before, before and after the, um, uh, the Second Vatican Council. Nothing kind of binding, of course. It's mm. th often these are the kind of low-level documents, yes, like chirographs. And exactly, like low-level low documents often, and um, you know, and so they're kind of easily ignored. What Cardinal Ratzinger answers is that. That while this has always been done in a sense, you know, you bring the opera in or you bring the different 
different things. What he 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 makes the point that that often these musical styles that came in before and were kind of incorporated, transformed, turned into sacred music. Uh, often these styles, whether it's the Baroque style, the classical style, uh, other medieval secular styles, or whatever, um, well, these are still emerging from a from a Christian culture, right? So he says, you know. The anthropology or the theology that lies behind the assumptions of the composers of these styles, where this, the style emerges from Western Christendom, while Western Christendom is still Christian, right. and so the the kind of assumptions about the world, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and about man, they, so so that while they may not be ideal for church music, they still come from that baptized. So culture. even if you're using secular or folk music of the time in madrigals or, th- or you know, borrowing from that kind of uh, definitely secular musical style, they're coming from a not. I mean, it's only kind of secular in in uh, to a, to an extent because you're in a kind of Christian yeah. context. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like uh, there are examples in the 16th century or and uh, 15th and 16th century of composers using songs about i don't know um well about prostitutes in, in a famous example or about the armed man in another case uh, you know militias or, or whatever there are examples of that but again it's the musical style is not in question the content of the song is in question if that makes sense yeah. and so when he then looks at say music from the 20th century rock music jazz whatever that he talks about you know how do, how would what do we need to look at when we decide whether these can come into the into the liturgical music? What he's saying is, well, we need to examine what's the spirit in which these genres are created. We can't take it for granted that musical genres have a Christian understanding of the world or a Christian anthropology, a Christian uh, ass- assumption at base, you know. And so what he says is, you know, we need to be very careful about that, about, say, accepting... You know, I mean, to take an extreme example, we might say, well, what about, say, death metal? You know, what are the preconditions there for, for, you know, what are the assumptions about the world in that music? Is that something that harmonizes with the vision of the liturgy or the vision of scripture, the words that are being sung? Now, you could say, well, there are Christian metal bands. Sure, there are. Is that music, though, appropriate then for liturgy? You know, is the question. Mm. You know, how does it fit with that? tradition and so that's I, th- I find I mean I'm I'm summarizing here a very sophisticated argument by a great theologian which I am not <laughs> so um, you know I think I think that's worth but it's definitely I think the point is worth thinking about you know? well, I think that's that's very helpful because I often I think the arguments made well you know when Mozart wrote his masses and brought in you know kind of baroque music into the church you know, no one's sort of really complaining about that. Although I think there were there well, were yeah, some complaints were, at the time. Yes. But then you get to kind of more pronounced um, differences. So, for example, something like Verdi's Requiem, which he he never kind of really foresaw as for for real kind of use in the liturgy. But already Verdi's uh, presuppositions were often uh, yeah. Odds, I mean, he was an, he was basically church. an atheist. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, Verdi was not a believer. Um, and so, and you can hear. I mean, you can hear that in the requiem. It's a it's a piece of cosmic opera, yeah, isn't it? I mean, that poor soprano at the end who just sounds so terrified. At the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and and I think, you know, and the Dies Irae is, is opera. It's, yes, it's it's not prayer, and you can you can hear that in in Verdi's requiem. Um, you, you can almost, if you compare it with with Mozart's, you can almost see that that the. the Mozart's presuppositions are more kind of in line with the, the text. In the yeah, sense, you know, you get that feeling. Yeah, although of course, you know, there's the whole question about whether was Mes- was he a Mason? Yeah, you know, was yeah. Mozart a Mason? And one, I think, one shouldn't necessarily talk about intention so much as lang as the as the lang as the stylistic language. You know, so you know, Mozart may inf- may have been a Mason, may have not been, you know, an Orthodox Catholic believer or whatever. But that n- doesn't necessarily matter if the style if the, the material that he's working with, the style that he's writing in, is itself of an origin that is, you know, he knew how to write sacred style. And so he did. I mean, I suppose we could say the same thing about Bach. You know, Bach's musical style is eminently suited to worship. Um, Bach was not a Catholic, but can we use 
his hymn tunes in masses? Could we use the B minor mass liturgically? Probably we could, you know, and because it's a liturgical style that he's writing it. It's a style which is consistent with it. I mean, Beethoven, another example would be the Beethoven Missa Solemnis. Um, some people have said that the Missa Sole- you know, a mass would be a, an irreverent interruption of the Missa Solemnis, right, right. you know, <laughs> because, but again, because I think in that case, Beethoven is writing a monumental piece, and it's a, I think it is a testament of faith. Some people have questioned that. I think it is a testament of faith. But there, it's a testament of faith, and it was designed for liturgy, a huge liturgy for the installation of his um, patron, you know, uh, the Archbishop Rudolf, Archduke Rudolf, as a bishop. But, you know, there, there is a question to be asked, is, is there too much Beethoven in it? Do you know what I mean? Is it there, the, the, the question of the composer's, not intent, but the composer's own personal style, maybe becomes too much for a liturgical it's a dis- there it becomes a distraction in the Augustinian sense of you get so involved in the Beethoven that maybe mass is an irreverent interruption or you just probably ought not to do this in mass, you know. Mm. So, I mean, I think that, that that takes us quite interestingly up to, to the... Well, we were saying that most of the documents that spoke about music were kind of low-level documents, but then we get to Vatican II and we have kind of the highest possible uh, level of document in uh, the first the first document that the, the Vatican uh, II uh, puts out is the document on the liturgy and it has quite a lot to say on liturgical music and I mean do you want to just kind of summarize a bit what what Sacrosanctum Concilium says about music and then um, maybe see a dangerous thing to do yeah and then, <laughs> and, then, and then maybe we can talk about kind of what happened afterwards yeah, well, it's not. I mean, it's not a lot, really. I mean, it kind of is, as as often with a lot of the Vatican II documents and in the Sacrum Signum and Concilium, there's a kind of assumption that things will continue mm. as is, you know, and that Gregorian chant is the standard, um, and but that we mustn't exclude other forms, other sacred, other forms of music, insofar as they are sacred or you know that they are in relationship with, you know, a musicam sacram is another is, is another document from Vatican II which basically does this and says, you know, I mean, it, as often with church musics on church writings on liturgy in the last hundred years and especially on uh, and on music, it's always a very strong recommendation or an assumption of continuance, but leaves room for development, for development or abuse, you know, or yeah. whatever. You know, there's never a kind of like, there's nowhere does it say you must use Gregorian chant. You know, but that Gregorian chant is presumed to be the music par excellence of the Roman liturgy, and therefore it's the default option. I would say um, would be my summary of my reading. Yeah, of, of and, those and that choirs were an important part of the, the yes. church's yeah. kind of armory. That we should be, yeah, the parishes should be supporting choirs and should be training them in in the music of the church, which is. Which is chant, you know, and and the instrumentation as well. Yeah, that the organ is the default again. I think this is the. I think this is often the case with Vatican II on the liturgy. Is it assumes a default, but leaves open room for change. You know, where how far the change was, what change was envisaged, is a question that is still open for debate and very much up for debate, and you know not a fun debate to wade into right right <laughs> so, so well let's go there um no because i mean it's interesting when i was when i was growing up in southeast london i remember um it was it, it was a you know we had an old irish parish priest who i think in terms of the reforms post vatican II, he, he kind of implemented them kind of slowly and i think by the time he he uh had gone to his eternal reward in the 80s i think he still had a choir that was sitting up in the on, on the sanctuary, and they still still did let some Latin chant. And I remember we had a younger parish priest that came in, and sort of said, "Right, Vatican II requires that we we stop doing all that, and that we get rid of the choir in order to allow the people to sing." Mm-hmm. And and kind of that was it. And so for about twenty five years, I don't think we we heard any chant of any kind uh, in that in that parish. And it, it was interesting that kind of those documents which presumed that Gregorian was only, was always going to be 
you know, the, the mainstay and that choirs were going to be an important thing. In the name of those documents, that the, the exact opposite was done. So, um, and we went to this more, yeah, we had a folk mess like many, many parishes. So kind of what happened there? Would you say? I wouldn't like to. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't like to speculate. I wouldn't like to open any windows into yeah, men's yeah. hearts yeah. on this question. You know, because I think it was a very. I mean, it was a time of huge change in everything, societally, societally as well, and it was a maelstrom. I mean, I'm too young for all of that. You know, I mean, I, I, I was, I was only born in the 80s, and so, I, as I said, I think earlier on, you know, the, um, I had an, a, a, an old Northern Irish parish priest, and we had good. You know, we had what I would consider traditional hymns, you know, a uh, kind of lot, lot of Victoriana and early 20th century, but with a mixture of some of the newer things. But yes, chant was not was not present except in, say, benediction, you know, which to me was a wonderful. When I was an altar server, and I remember, you know, the Tantum Ergo was probably, I, I, I said that the Salve Regina was the first chant that I remember, but of course I was forgetting that we sung the Tantum Ergo all the way through my childhood, you know, and that was to me that really did was something special. I remember it always being it's the most special moment. There were no moments like that in mass musically, which I think is a shame. Mm. You know, um, no more. You know, because that sacred the sacred language of Latin, the slightly alien musical language, because of course it's you know seven hundred years old or whatever that tune. Those those aspects of it you know, r remained with me. And I think some people, I think that the tantum ergo is one of those few things that people do know that did survive because of, you know, uh, that. Now, the question of, you know, what happened, I think that's a huge history that's be still being written, mm. really. And, um, yeah, that, I mean, that generation of priests and bishops um, made changes... And I think often in very good faith, and I think that's yeah. the, that's the point, isn't it? And I think now those of us who are the, the next generation are looking back and going, well, are, are discovering what they removed, the yeah, musical I, equivalent of altar rails. Yeah, because, <laughs> because yeah, because in a sense there were, there was all this experimentation going on, mm -hmm. and I mean, you know, I think we're we're at a point sort of forty years, fifty years later where we can kind of look back and, and see whether those experiments were a success and whether they have yeah. a kind of, a, the, they have a lasting legacy. And so, and you definitely get the feeling that in terms of, you know, the kind of folk hymnal. So that, that was a, that was an interesting kind of experiment. So you're, what's, what's happening, you're in the sort of late sixties, mm -hmm. big explosion of, of kind of folk music through various, you know, famous, um, singers and and none so of which is really folk music. I mean, the, right? <laughs> you know, I mean, it's a lot of it is a, sim a simulacrum of folk music. You know, it's a kind of attempt to create a folk atmosphere. But of course, you've got composers writing it, whether in mm. the pop sphere. You know, I mean, genuine folk music is something that extends back through through his you know through history and time immemorial. You know, doesn't necessarily have a composer, and is passed down and from co th through communities. And so an, an idea of a kind of corporate folk music is somehow, to me, it strikes me as a kind of strange oxymoron or, a, you know, a paradox. You know, how can you have a, how can you have, you know, corporate folk, you know, and which, which I think it often is what people feel about a lot of these folk hymnals, folk hymns, or even folk, you know, popular folk music is, it's not the real thing. And so there's a sense of inauthenticity about it. Right. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, that's 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 what it, fe it appears to be to me, and it's probably why a lot of it's been rejected by younger generations. You know, and also in in a sense, it, it was never a, a lot of those kind of, of folk tunes were made for kind of solo singing, and and so you you you'd try and bring it into a church and get a, 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 con a large congregation to sing, it and the, the music just wasn't kind of suited to that. But something like a, a genuine folk tune, mm. like Danny Boy, yeah, yeah, you, know, um, you know that that actually works quite nicely as a hymn <laughs> tune right. you know something that's a actually authentic an authentic folk melody um arising from an authentic you know arising from you know real people in in a catholic country i think one of the problems is people trying to manufacture authenticity yeah 
and manufacture participation, you know, and manufacture enthusiasm and sentiment. Um, and I think that's that was something that was attempted to be, you know, you know, I, I, again, I, I can't comment on intention, you know, or goodwill or whatever. But I, I mean, I imagine, you know, when you look at when there were people looking around at society and seeing waves of enthusiasm among political groups and political rallies and protests and huge concerts and the rest of it and seeing these people united through this kind of musical yeah, yeah. and political vision and they were and they were thinking well we want to have some of that in the church we want that enthusiasm in the church so how do we do it well we need to replicate that yeah. atmosphere i mean it's very interesting that you say that because in uh, with my italian background um you, you saw in Italy where they didn't really have a tradition of kind of congregational hymn singing. They had they had um, uh, kind of devotional hymns for processions and stuff, but that was never really for use in in the church building as such. So in in the seventies, when all of a sudden congregational singing it seems to be now you know the, the the done thing, they don't really have a kind of tradition on which to to lean like we did here. And so they're kind of looking around and saying, what can we use? And it tends to be these kind of 60s protest songs. Yeah. And uh, as you say, you know, what, what is it that people all sing together in a, in a crowd? Protest well, songs. Well, I think what's interesting is when, when, when Pugin was complaining about, about things again, I keep going back to Pugin, yeah. but he wrote this, uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic little tract on Gregorian chant. And, and the, but he talks about an experience he had, I think in Austria, but I could be wrong, where he talks about hearing a whole crowd singing Credo Three, singing the, the you know, Credo Edunum Deum, and he, he talks about eight hundred people, I think, singing all together, and how stirring it was to hear them all singing Gregorian chant together. And actually, one of the vision of the reformers before Vatican II, you know, the liturgical movement, they wanted to actually get away from hymn singing at mass. So there was a tradition of singing hymns mm. during Mass, you know, because the congregation weren't participating in the responses, right? Because in the old Mass, it was, the, con it was the, the servers that did the responses. You know, the congregation were there and participating inwardly, one hopes. But externally, it was a case of they'd sing a hymn at, after communion or at the beginning or whatever if there was no chanting. And one of the things that the liturgical movement wanted to do up to Vatican II was to actually get rid of singing at mass so you know you sing the hymns that you know on repeat and wanting to replace it with singing the mass so there's this distinction which i think is really important and it is made in vatican ii as well that we want people to sing the mass which means singing the entrance antiphons or participating in the um the psalmody participating in responses in the ordinary of the mass the kyria the gloria the Sanctus, the Annus Dei, things that would have been maybe reserved more for quiet before. But those are the parts of the Mass itself, rather than extraneous hymns, which are not part of the Mass, and which the selection of which is, is, is very much at the whim of either the it's congregation. Very subjective or very, you know, you, know, it's, you know, I mean, it's exhausting being a music director, <laughs> right? Because you have to, every week, you have to look at the, the readings. Thousands of options. Look at the readings and then go, okay, which hymns do we sing? You know, maybe there's a hymn that's really appropriate, but nobody knows it because you've never learned it in your church before. So you go, okay, well, we'll do Sweet Sacrament Divine again or we'll sing Shine, Jesus, Shine because everyone everyone gets joins in with that and maybe Shine, Jesus, Shine is just not appropriate at that mass because it's Lent or whatever, you know, and so... You know, the, but what we're not doing is focusing on people singing the mass, participating. I mean, that participation that, that was the active participation that was so uh, vaunted by the reformers um, was not necessarily the way it was envisaged by the reformers previous to Vatican II. We've ended up with what's often called the four hymn sandwich. And people don't know how to sing the Gloria or the, 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 uh, the Sanctus or which should be the priority for singing. Now, of course, people, you know, plenty of places do that as well, you know, and do both. But the priority it often feels in an ordinary parish is given to the, the, the hymns. And that's what people talk, think about when they think about music at mass is, is, is the hymns. I mean, that's what you started talking about straight away um, when talking about the Italian situation. Um, 
And I remember Cardinal Sarah when he was prefect for the Congregation of Divine Worship saying, you know, every Catholic in the world ought to know the parts of the Mass in Latin so that wherever you go in the universal church, you can join in with, say, the, the, the Gloria, Missa de Angelis, or the Sanctus, or the Creed, as, you know, so that we have this idea that, so that everyone can sing the Mass wherever they go. You know, he even, I think he said, singing the Our Father, the Pater Noster in Latin as well, would be desirable for all Catholics, you know. And, um, and I can't help but agree with that when I, you know, if I visit Italy or if I visit anywhere in the world, I can only participate if there's singing in Latin, you know, the, a universal language with a universal musical style. Often I feel very alienated if I go to a foreign country and I can't join in with the... Yeah, because it, in a sense it's, it's very specific to, to the place and that, that's kind of what in one sense the beauty, the beauty of the, the local traditions, etc. But yeah, when we I come mean, to the mass, we, we like something a bit more... Uh, kind of universal, I suppose. Uh, well, uh, exactly, and it's wel it's welcoming, I think, in a way that that you know, um, local, very localized hymns are not. And I think hymns, hymns, as you said, in processions or outside in in what you know, paraliturgical contexts, are great. Um, and I think, but I think we lost a lot of that after Vatican II as well. There was a lot of focus on the Sunday Mass is is it for the church for the parish in terms of devotions and. May processions, Corpus Christi processions, other devotions, 40 hours devotions, they all kind of, they were stripped out and yeah. taken away. And so the opportunities for singing those hymns that have been passed down disappeared. Yeah, which means you, you kind of lo lose a lot of the repertoire. Basically. You lose yeah. a lot of the repertoire, a lot of the opportunities. All they get taken from those, from the processions and put into the mass instead. And so I think that was a missed opportunity. And... Yeah, we 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 reduced op we reduced opportunities for singing together as parishes, um, and ended up putting so, more into So, so in that kind of in that period between the seventies and and I would say maybe two thousand and ten, so you know you've got you've got the kind of the attempt at the a kind of folk revival mass, which sort of peters out, I think, a bit. Um, there are other types of music that that get kind of brought. I mean, you mentioned Shine Jesus Shine and and various other. Kind of types of hymns which we will all remember, especially from primary school, which became the kind of staple. Um, but I would say that with the new missile, the the new translation of the missile that came out in two thousand and ten, um, the church really put chant, I think, back front and center because um, I mean this was something that we noticed very much as the kind of publishers of the missile was that all of a sudden you had a huge amount of music in the in the missile itself. And the music was placed before the the written text, and it, and it was very clear that what the church was trying to say was okay. The, our our tradition of chanting the parts of the mass is really important, and in fact, the as as we said before, the the kind of um, we we should we should actually think of chanting before we think of of reading, and that that was there, and all of a sudden. You know the, the simple mass that's in the simple chant mass that's in the missal suddenly started being used mm. all over the place, and um, so I think I think that was there was a definite uh, there was a definite kind of change of tack. I think. Uh, yeah, I think to a, to a degree there is a problem. There, there was a, a, a little problem with that with that translation in that the, the the texts for the opening antiphons and communion antiphons were all changed as mm. well, um, which meant that all the chants, the traditional chants for the for the Sundays and the feasts and whatever, suddenly those were no longer the correct texts. Yeah. And so that, that did cause a problem for, some, for those of us. But then people have stepped into the breach very well. There's a wonderful publication by Father Samuel Weber from America who's taken the traditional chant melodies and, and put the new English texts to them. And, uh, you know, and certainly I've seen that being used in places um, another by Adam Bartlett, I think, is another composer who's done something similar to that. And so, yeah, there's certainly, uh, I think, the sense that, yeah, we can, we need to get back to singing the Mass. And I think that that is starting to, and I think, yeah, the influence of Benedict the Sixteenth is very important there. Um, and, you know, Cardinal Seurat at the, at, at, at the Congregation of the Doctrine of, of, of sorry, the uh, of Divine Worship. And this sense, yes, that, that chant is important. And... And yeah, the chance the simple mass in the missal is a great default to have. Mm -hmm. 
and you know, some of those melodies, I think the, the, the Holy Holy, the, the, the Lamb of God, we think is, is, could be as old as third or fourth centuries, potentially. Yeah, I think I, I, think I read that the Gloria might even have its, its roots in the temple liturgy. I mean, it's, yeah, the again. Gloria is a bit, it's a bit kind of monotonous, the, the one that's in the, in, in the Missal, but I, I hear that it, I've, I've Yeah, I mean, these somewhere. are old tones. They're very, very old tones, very, very old melodies, very simple and easy to learn. Mm. Just because they're simple doesn't mean they're old, of course, that's a yeah. fallacy. But, the, but the, the fact is that, you know, they are simple, they're easy to learn, they're easy to pick up, and so it can be a default, even at a, you know, even at a ferial mass. You know, and one thing that the, the general instruction of the missal says very clearly is, you know, you should be singing the Sanctus and you should be singing the Alleluia. And in fact, I think it says that if the Alleluia is not to be sung in one place, then it should be omitted. You know, that the Alleluia should never be said. You know, it should be, it should be the gospel acclamation should be sung to a simple Alleluia. The Sanctus again. And I think this is one of the things that, you know, getting to that back to the idea of the cosmic music as well. Every time we sing the, the Holy Holy, it's immediately prefaced by we're singing this with the angels and the saints in heaven in the cosmic liturgy. Our voices join with theirs as we sing. Holy, holy, holy. holy. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. And it just kind of falls flat. Whereas it's a big climactic moment. It's the most important moment in the mass. And, and musically speaking, it should be sung every time. We should be using music to emphasize that. So that, uh, that brings us, I think, nicely on to the work that we've, we've been doing for the past uh, year or two. Yeah. Um, so... The, the texts of the of the lectionary have been updated, uh, the readings into the uh, ESV and the Psalms into the new version of the Grail Psalms, which has meant that all the the, the responsorial Psalms that have been composed in the past sort of fifty years now don't quite fit the the new text of the Mass, which has given us a, a real I think opportunity to do something I think quite interesting. So. Um, Tell us a little bit about the the idea behind the Psalms for All Seasons. What's the kind of the programmatic idea? Yeah, say? so the idea is, I, th I, I don't think it's been done before, but I'm, I, I'm happy to be corrected. But the idea of s is a seasonality, and this really comes out of um, my experience growing up of the church year and the idea. I mean, uh, so um, uh, one of the things I noticed growing up is how powerful uh, and as a parent now as well, how powerful it is to have traditions for the different parts of the church as you're in the domestic church. You know, the seasons of the church are how we should be living our life, as it were. Yeah. So, you know, every time, you know, Christmas comes around, you have your Christmas traditions and Easter and Lent and, and the rest of it. And the same thing is true of music as well. You know, we love our Christmas carols. We love our Easter carols and songs. We love, you know, uh, we, we love our songs for the saints. For, you know, and all the rest of it, and and you know, Lent is really marked by a, a difference in the music. Difference often. in the music, yeah. it can be, yeah, absolutely, and 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 also, of course, you know, the church does this with its liturgical colours, with re, you know, removing the Alleluia during Lent, and uh, used to be Advent as well. Um, you know, decorating the church in different ways, stripping the church, you know, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, now, musically speaking, in terms of chant. There isn't really a tradition of this, except in so far as some particular melodies were sung at particular times. So, you know, it used to be, for example, the ordinary Sundays, you would sing a particular melody for the Kyrie, the Gloria. You know, the same thing for particular feast types of feasts, for Marian feasts or whatever. You would have this particular tune. And so I thought, well, why not apply this to the to the Psalms as well? So that when you get to Advent, just like you change to purple vestments, you change to a particular psalm melody that you sing during Advent. When you get to Christmas, you change the vestments and the decoration of the church, and you have a different psalm melody again that goes all the way through the season of Christmas into, um, you know, up to around, you know, the baptism of the Lord. Same for Lent, same for Easter, same for feasts and ordinary time. Now, ordinary time is a little bit more difficult because it's very long to so have one tune would be 34 weeks for 34 weeks might be a bit much so there um we linked it with the office where the office has a four-week cycle same thing for the tunes for the ordinary time you would have a four week four different melodies for four, for the four weeks of um that's that kind of monthly cycle in the office and you so that would then give a little variety through ordinary time and so the idea would be i mean there are two kind of purposes to this 
Um, one is this, the, I think the higher and uh, kind of intention is this seasonality that over time um, congregations would come to rec recognize the melodies uh, and they become as familiar as the, the vestment changes and the other changes in those seasons so that the seasonality of the, the kind of living the church's year becomes embedded in in the mass you know and we recognize the tunes etc the other is of course that I, I was always frustrated as a director of music and as a singer that every week you seem to have a different psalm tune that you have to learn and so the time taken up teaching it to the choir and then the time taken up teaching it to the congregation means that you maybe don't have as much time to do a, a new mass setting or to learn hymns properly or whatever other congregations are not familiar with 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 it so that if you have every every week is a new tune by a new composer sometimes in some mass in some psalm books and, and in quite different styles in sometimes. different styles yeah they could be very contrasting with each other i mean it's kind of nice but it does seem to defeat it does it does to me it it it, it makes it more difficult to sing the liturgy in that to sing the mass in that sense mm -hmm. But also what it does is I think it draws attention to the music, right? That the music, oh, this week it's this psalm and we have to learn this one. Do we like this one or not? We have to learn it. Here are its peculiar difficulties, uh, peculiar stylistic quirks or whatever. But there's, there's, not, there's no consistency uh, there. And my intention was in writing this music was, was that that musical kind of differentiation was focused on the, the larger scale. So it happens uh, every season. Um, and from week to week, all you're doing is adapting the tune to fit the different lengths of text. So some are very, very short, some are much longer. And so the, 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 the antiphon music has to be able to kind of be elastic to accommodate those changes of length. But the psalm tone itself is the same, so that the cantor will just be singing for the whole of Lent, will have the same tune to do the thing to. And what this does is, it then the music becomes a servant of the words and the words themselves are you know people f stop noticing the music as it were and this and it becomes a delivery system for the word for the for the for the psalms and for the prayer and hopefully then becomes more prayerful and less a question of oh this is a hard one this week or yeah. whatever and, yeah. there's, and there's a familiarity with the tune that the, the people don't need to learn like a, a completely different it's not completely different. Some it's a variation yeah. on the on the tune this time. Last week or the week before, or the week before, or the week before that. By the time they got to the end of the Lent, it's second nature, and and the harmonic and melodic shape of it is natural, so it becomes quicker to learn as well. And by the time you've done the three year cycle, those tunes are all very much embedded, so that when you come back to your A again, you know it's 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 easy to go. The same thing with the Alleluia, Alleluia's as well, because I've composed a whole new set of Alleluia's so that each of these tunes has an associated Alleluia for the gospel as well. And then all the way through this, mindful of the church's kind of tradition and the teaching, you know, about relationship to Gregorian chant, a lot of the melodies that I've composed are based on signature tunes for the season or, or, or um, you know, Gregorian melodies. They often begin with a recognition if you know Gregorian chant you would recognize the beginning of the melody is is associated with a particular gradual chant so the gradual is the chant that would be used in the place of the responsorial psalm in an, a latin mass so these ancient melodies i've kind of tried to incorporate those a little bit into the into those so for the easter season all of the melodies are based you know are based on the tune heck dies this is the day the Lord has made, which is the um, the Alleluia melody for the or the gradual melody, sorry, for the um, for Easter Sunday. And so you then you use that all the way through the Easter season, so that it's and then it's also maybe then when you hear chant that it's not so unfamiliar to you, um, you know. Um, the Alleluias. Similarly, I've done something a little bit different with these. Again, I've taken mostly taken. Gregorian, the beginnings of Gregorian Alleluias, and then also a little bit more of the melisma. So I've tried to kind of, one of the things that, that we do, that, that, that the Novus Ordo Alleluias have often done is very wordy, lots of repeating Alleluia, 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 whereas in Gregorian Alleluias often they have a single Alleluia with a long bit at the end, like I sang earlier, with a long mm -hmm. bit on the R. Now I haven't replicated the huge long R, but I've tried to just slightly extend them a bit so they're a little more musical and a little less wordy so that the Alleluias 
have a flavour of singing the Gregorian chant without going all in uh, into them. And I think, uh, I hope, that they're successful and will become second nature and people will enjoy singing. Well, we've, we've been recording a, a, a few over the past few days, and I must say the melody really got kind of stuck in my mind, and uh, which, which is great. And I think, you know, in a sense, what we're doing here is a very kind of Catholic thing. You know, we, we're, we've got these new texts which are... Um, you know, bang up to date in terms of, of uh, the, the biblical um, scholarship, uh, the, 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 the most accurate texts uh, in terms of the translation. Um, but at the same time, we are, we're, we're putting those together with some very ancient um, melodies. Um, and, you know, we're taking out of our storehouse things old and, and new. I think Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, th- certainly the, the settings of the psalm tones themselves so these psalm tones are not Gregorian. I don't really believe that the Gregorian tones, which were created for Latin, after all, work very well in English. Um, there are some little hints of, in, in, of intonations, you know. But on the whole, the, the way I've tried to set those, the, the, psalm, to- the psalm tones, the, the verses, those are probably will be more familiar to people who are maybe familiar with um, other types of more modern psalm settings. So there's a kind of, a meeting of those two together. One thing I have brought in, which is fairly new, I suppose, is I've tried to, the melodies are, again, as well as beginning often Gregorian, they often, they will end a little bit more Gregorian, so I've tried to kind of use a little bit of Gregorian modality in there as well, which might mean that some of the endings are a little unfamiliar. But but again, I think that they're, they sing well, and the modern harmony that's underneath will help to support people to learn to learn those. And you know, if you sing them together with a Missa De Angelis or the chant, they won't kind of jar. It won't clash. No, won't. exactly. It will. It you know, I think I think you could sing one of these, you know, psalms and then do a Gregorian Alleluia, you know, or you could sing a gradual and replace the Gregorian Alleluia with one of my Alleluias. Maybe you wouldn't do that, but I think that they could marry. And I think that that's, they do, you know, I think say, the way that the psalm is set, the verses, I think is one of the best things that has been, that has come out of the changes the, into the vernacular. The way those f- kind of using a series of four bars, you know, and each line is adapted to its own melody and they flow together like that. I think that's, a, that's the, the way we've come up with to do these chants, to congregate these, these psalms in English. I think that works very nicely. I think the, the antiphons, making the antiphons closer to chant um, and following the rhythm of the words as well. So one thing I was very clear to, I wanted to avoid was any sense of kind of strong pulse or a kind of, mm-hmm. kind of sense of a really kind of strong um, beat so that it doesn't feel, doesn't stray too much into dance, dance-like kind of ter- territory. There are occasions I've let that slip. So all, there are one or two moments in Easter where I particu- where, I, uh, where it felt appropriate to do something a little bit more rhythmical because it was i think uh the the example is uh, ascension i think i've made it a little bit more regular so it's a bit more but most of the time the, the music follows the words and so the, the the rhythm follows the words advent is another one i think where it's more regular but but um for for most of the year most of these tunes the, the words lead lead which the is music. The, the sort of strong tradition in, yes. in well i mean in chance, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean the the other thing I think I think that's 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 great. I mean, CTS the first the first music that we published in many many years was the was the accompaniment to the to the chant in the in the missal. Now this is this is sort of a, a larger offering, and uh, we we hope very much to be able to bring more of the best um, in in liturgical music to uh, to the church in in the UK and abroad. So I think if if I may just sort of end with a question. You know what? What's your feeling about the the future of of uh, liturgical music within the Catholic Church? Do you see it as a as a kind of bright future? Are we are we coming out of the the a kind of darker period? And uh, well, anybody who knows me knows I'm a bit of a pessimist. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd like to think um, that yeah, I'd like to think that that I think it's been such a turbulent 50, 60 years in litur- in lit- liturgy. Never mind liturgical music. Um, but I think that the feeling of what's called, been called the liturgy wars is is abating. I think there's a I think there's a sense in which um, the people who carried out those wars or who participated in those wars are getting older, and those of us who are younger 
um, are not so interested in a battle so much as doing the right, you know, the creating beautiful liturgies and 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 doing beautiful music, you know, and and I think I think that's I think that's the future. I think is trying is is trying not to make things political and just trying to do to be at the service of God and the church um, in t in producing beautiful music, um, you know, and I've I. I, you know, I know plenty of young musicians um, who are interested in in creating beautiful music, in creating music that is appropriate to the liturgy, um, and who are. I mean, I, I have to say, you know, the great writings of Pope Benedict the Sixteenth on liturgical music—they're starting to become better known. I mean, and and people are reading his legacy of of thought on this. I mean, I I genuinely think that his right his thought on. Um, the theology of liturgy and the theology of music is unparalleled, and and I think people are starting to understand to really get to grips with it now, and to and then to try and find a way of making that making that work, you know, um, in practice. Yeah, and after all, it's, it's beauty that will save the world. No? Beauty will save the world. Yeah. No, it's been it's been wonderful to speak with you, Matthew, and I hope that uh, we can do lots more in in this. I think kind of revival of, of uh, church music together. I hope so. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.